There are hundreds of people here tonight that have to decide tonight, and your decision tonight, yes or no, will decide where you'll be a hundred years from now. I believe that none of you are here by accident tonight. I believe that you're here on this particular night because this is the night that you are to meet God in a new way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 Take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All right, so I'm going to give you, the viewer, the option to take the blue pill or to continue watching, take the red pill. want to know what it is. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Well, I guess you took the red pill, like Neo, because you're still here. Hmm. How do we go back in time? I know. Let's see what Doc and Marty are up to. Now, let's go back to year one, Hollywood style, because it all started in the Garden of Eden. Way back to the year one. I mean, he's 40 years of age. He has no child, he has no recall, he doesn't say, how did I get here? But he's quite happy, he just kind of thumbs around the God, working away, and God is looking at him. And he says that I know he's happy. <laughs> Sneaks down like a thief and steals, doesn't ask, doesn't request, doesn't steals it. His rib. And from his rib, he makes woman. And Adam wakes up in the morning, he's a real thicky. <laughs> he's lying there, and there's somebody else, he doesn't say, Where did you come from? Where did you, how the hell did you get here? Where did you, where did you get those lumps? <laughs> Going over the uh, tree of knowledge. That's the tree oh, but she did eat that apple. Sort of and so did Adam. Sort of and so did Jack Black. Year one. Well, after the snack would change the world, wow. Noah decides Honey, not to obey God's anything? orders. Alpha and Omega hardware? Never heard of them. Me either. What do we have? <gasps> what is this stuff? This is one of my favorite movie scenes. And just like God, with a sense of humor. Come on! Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Beards on no. men, 
or the standard back in the Bible days. But today, we like a good clean face. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> wow. Oh, look at the scruffle, mountain man. Oh, well, you know, I figured it was a weekend and I thought, oh. What? Oh. And God flooded the earth and wiped out all the evil people. And after days turned to months, and months into years. God let the planet dry out, and he promised to never flood the entire earth again with a rainbow. For the place where I most God really liked flawed humans God. with not great pasts. Take Moses, for example. He was a slave that God called to lead his people out of slavery. I am the God of thy father. Therefore I will send thee, Moses, unto Pharaoh that thou mayst bring my people out of Egypt. Who am I, Lord, that you should send me? How can I lead this people out of bondage? What words can I speak that they will heed? I will teach thee what thou wilt say. In this you shall know that the Lord is God. So, after God freed the slaves, they rebelled and became addicted to sin. So, God created the Ten Commandments and handed them to Moses as the law. Well, I think we all know how that turned out. Live by your commandments, we're free. There is no freedom without the law. God has set before you this day his laws of life and good and death and evil. Those who will not live by the law shall die by the law. And Moses decided to retire from being a prophet and decided to go into acting. And he wanted to read us a little story about a man named Jonah who disobeys God's orders for his life. Hello, I'm Charlton Heston. I'd like to introduce you to a wonderful story called Jonah and the Whale. Well, here's a fun cartoon with a song to tell you the story. Jonah finally learned to let go of his hate. Oh yeah, well you know the rest of the Old Testament books in the Bible. You know, pretty much all stories of people turning away from God and saying that they don't need God and then, well anyways, let's go to the New Testament. Alright, so words ready? And go! One thing that's about the same from the Old Testament to the New Testament is there's still a lot of slavery going on, especially in year one. You seem to enjoy your work. How long yeah. have you been a slave? <laughs> I'm not a slave. I'm a volunteer. Yeah. But what about Mary? You know, Jesus' mom. What about Mary? Hmm. Can we change this to an animation? Now, in another ah, city called Nazareth, much better. there lived Elizabeth's cousin a young girl named Mary who was soon to be married to a man named Joseph. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Who? Who are you? Do not fear, for you have found favor with God. You will soon give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. What? But how can this be? 
Can you imagine if that happened today? Let's fast forward back to the present to a little Story. show called Dr. Phil. Coming up. I am pregnant. And it is Jesus. I'm nine months pregnant. My family, my friend, pastors at church, they don't believe that I'm pregnant. I'm not stupid. I'm not crazy. I'm tired of playing these games. I mean, she must have faced so much ridicule by saying she's going to give birth. And she's still a virgin. You're not pregnant. You're uh, too tiny. You're probably just getting fat. Okay, it's good to meet all, all of you. And tell me, Haley, do you feel tension in your family right now? Definitely. You, you ask for an ultrasound, and uh, how did that go? Was the technician nice to you? And it was really nice. Like I never. That was my first ultrasound, and yeah. it was kind of weird. Like she was pressing really hard and stuff, and I could feel him kick and stuff, but it was it was kind of weird. Right. <laughs> the gel was really cold. And um, Dr. Short, this was done on the set of the doctors because you have created examination rooms over there and have an amazing array of equipment. Yeah, we have exam rooms, we have ultrasound machines, so this morning was when the ultrasound was performed on Haley. And this is a pelvic ultrasound, and the ultrasound machine is basically showing your abdomen the area exactly where you would expect to see the pregnancy. And there is no baby. Oh yeah, Joseph, the kind of baby daddy who well, should probably get a DNA test on Maury, just to make sure that it's his. You are not. I mean, I guess if any of us found out that it wasn't ours, I guess our first response would probably be, get on your donkey and ride out of town as fast as you can. But Joseph didn't run, because God called him to be the father of Jesus. And so Joseph, decided not to follow God's plan, but then he did. After a few visions from God, and another vision, and another vision, and a vision from an angel, I guess God's got a little bit of a sense of humor, and he definitely is persistent. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The angel also told him that Mary would bear a son and that Joseph was to name him Jesus. And so, Christmas is coming. In fulfillment of prophecy, both Gospels give the Bethlehem in Judea as Christ's birthplace. Luke tells us that because of the influx of travelers, there was no lodging to be found. He then goes on to describe the scene known throughout the world as the Nativity. We make it so angelic and beautiful. So Jesus is born into the world. But this was a stable. It speaks of the poverty. It speaks of the desperation that Joseph and Mary found themselves. And Jesus is welcomed into the world by the three wise camels and men with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Next came a trip to Jerusalem for the customary presentation of the baby to God in the temple, along with an offering. Scripture tells us that Joseph and Mary, they offer turtle doves. I think we have to just believe that uh, Joseph, who was so faithful to God, uh, that God, in the end, was faithful to him. Still fearing for his son's safety, Joseph headed north into Galilee and settled in Nazareth. That what was spoken of by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. You know who I feel sorry for? The people that were in the motel while God was being born in the barn. Just a few barnyard animals got to witness the entrance of the king. And a virgin maiden and her spouse, her husband, Joseph. And then she got to grow up with him. Isn't that cool? 
I mean, she got the green. Now, my dad, my dad's here tonight. My dad believes Jesus knew who he was the second he was conceived. I don't. And when daddy does his concert, he can say what he wants. <laughs> I said, daddy, if Jesus knew who he was the second he was conceived, then he was faking all those diaper changes. <laughs> because Mary changed God's diapers. Mary got to have God nurse at her breast. Mary taught God how to talk. Mary taught God how to walk because when our God came to earth, he set aside his omniscience, his omnipresence and wrapped himself in flesh and became one of us so we could know him. They're on pilgrimage. It was the time of Passover. And so again, being people who understand their faith, uh, understand the law, they go down to Jerusalem. We find Jesus making the trip with Joseph just at the point where he is becoming a man. When Jesus doesn't come back in the evening and Mary says, I thought he was with your family. And Joseph says, oh, but I thought he was with your family. And they ask around and he's nowhere to be found. Just think about that. About the, cause, and he was 12 years of age. He was teaching at the temple and he ditched his mom for two days. They went off and left Jesus, and Jesus wasn't with them. And can you imagine the panic in Mary's heart when she finally realized that Jesus wasn't with them? Here she's been entrusted with God's kid, and she's lost him. <laughs> and she hightails it back to Jerusalem. She said, where have you been? He said, don't you know? I must be about my father's business. And she bought it. <laughs> that line never worked for me. Mama said, I'll show you your father's business. Get in the house. Because my mama knew I wasn't virgin born. Luke reported that thereafter, Jesus was very obedient to Joseph and Mary. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he continued in subjection. to. And then we don't know what happened. Between 12 and 30, we have no idea what happened. Nobody wrote it down. Good night. God's in the house. Isn't somebody keeping a journal? <laughs> we have no idea what happened between 12 and 30. Nobody wrote it down. I want to know about those silent years. I want to know what he was like as a teenager. I want to know, did he, did he have a hero? I want to know, did she ever make him get a haircut? <laughs> I want to know, did she ever tell him to turn the music down? I want to know, did she walk into his room and say, good night, clean up this mess. Were you born in a barn? And Jesus performs a bunch of miracles, raising people from the dead, water into wine, the blind can see, just to name a few. He even threw over some tables in the temple, cast some demons out of pigs. Man, what a cool guy. And so the haters showed up to the party. They plotted and schemed. So he and the other priests had a delicate tightrope to walk. He's back. Arnold Schwarzenegger is the Terminator in the greatest action story ever. Or the Terminator could have warned Jesus. Maybe gone back in time. Or at least protected him. Brothers, my time with you is almost over. But for now, let us eat. Eat this! Greatest action story ever told. Bless this film. Let's time travel to the year 2004. Just hours ago, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, opened to the public. The most talked about movie of the new year, The Passion of the Christ, officially opened this morning across the country. More now on today's opening of Mel Gibson's controversial movie, The Passion of the Christ. All that controversy surrounding Mel Gibson's film, The Passion, has turned into big dollar signs. Overkill began even before the film was done. Allegations of anti-Semitism. That meant controversy. And controversy meant coverage. 
Who killed Jesus and why? That is the big debate. By the big debut, most of the questionable scenes had been re-edited. But that didn't stop the spectacle. Jewish groups, Christian groups, animal rights activists, you name it, everyone seemed to want to get their point across. I thought it was everything. I think uh, Mel Gibson did a good job. There were some scenes where it was just, you know, too much to watch. I thought the movie was awesome. There's a lot to digest. I definitely think it's something that you should see more than once. Most of the thousands of people around the country who've already screened Mel Gibson's film are his target audience, evangelicals, Catholics, bishops, pastors. Many of them react with ecstasy and weeping. But there are some people who have seen the film and left distressed. In fact, the movie seems to be a kind of Rorschach test, one picture, multiple perceptions. It wasn't some crud made up in Hollywood. It was real. I've never seen it laid out so brutally honest. It's, it's not about pointing the fingers. It's not about playing the blame game. It's about faith, hope, love, and forgiveness. The movie clearly blames the Jewish people for the death of Jesus. Was it hard for you to watch? It was definitely hard to watch. They walked out in tears. Did you expect to have this reaction when you heard about the movie? To have this reaction at all? I, mean, I would never die in that way for our sin. And vowed to renew their faith. Not only did some churches buy tickets in blocks of 20,000, they're calling it the best evangelical tool in 2,000 years. Go to this R-rated movie. Some of the churches are offering interactive CDs, framed photos, books about the movie. How does this make Gibson feel? You're not going to get the, you know, the Burger King hookup, you know, the Last Supper meal or something. It's like, you know, I, I, you know, I, this, this is the United States of America, and that sort of happened. And people decide it's best to profit on Jesus after his death. Christ action figure with walk on water action. I'm Jesus, king of the Jews. You're not the king of the Jews. Watch out, Jesus, it's a trap. Crucify him. The Jesus Christ action figure playset. Go ahead, throw the first stone. You said the Holy Ghost was working through me. I've received a lot of ridicule for that statement. I think that the Holy Ghost is real. I believe that he's looking favorably on this film. If you made a kind of religious map of America, here's how it would look. 82% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. Of those, six in 10 are Protestant, a quarter are Catholic, and the rest are Christians of different kinds. 2% are Jewish, less than 1% Muslim, and 13% of Americans say they have no religion. It is possible for people who are not even Christian to get into the kingdom of heaven. It's just easier. For, and I have to say that because that's what I believe. You have a non-stop ticket. Well, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm saying it's an easier ride where I am because it's like, uh, I have to believe it. Jesus Christ was crucified for all men, of all creeds, for all time. And he died for all of us. And the film went on to gross 612 million at the box office. It cost 30 million to make. And so Jesus is betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. And when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back his 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. And he said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went, and he hung himself. And so, Jesus is crucified. And Pilate had to do what he had to do. And the prophecy is fulfilled as Jesus is beaten for all of humankind's sins. And right about here, I struggled as a filmmaker. Do I show the rest? And I struggled and I said, I can't show it. I said, I can leave it up to the viewer to go research it for themselves, but I can't show it.
Lord Jesus on the third day rolled away the tombstone rock and rose from the dead to see his friends and family one last time. During the time he was gone, the Oscars were on, and his film The Passion of the Christ was nominated. The Oscar goes to Robert Richardson for the Aviator. Well, you can't win them all. The category is original score. And the Oscar goes to Jan A.P. Kaczmarek for Finding Neverland. Well, of course you can't win them all. Even if you are the son of God. And as the years pass, we come back to 1970 for a friendly game of Family Feud. Someone in the Bible whose name begins with J. Jonah. Jonah. It was a try, Richard. No, it's very good. Somewhere, Jesus is looking down, yes. saying, what, what? He didn't have 20 seconds. <laughs> But the real question was, what did Jesus look like? Can we see the actual face of Jesus? It is a stunning idea made possible by a team of graphic artists working on the Shroud of Turin, which is of course believed by millions to be the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ. Even the face of Jesus has been discovered, or so they tell us. Hmm. What did Jesus Christ really look like? There's a long tradition in Christian theology and Christian history of seeking the face of Christ, of wanting to know what he was like as a man. Oh, white Jesus. What did Jesus look like? And was he black? But I always wonder when I went to church on Sundays. I've always been one to, I'm not just a box. I do a lot of reading, a lot of studying. I ask questions. I go out, travel these countries. I watch how their people live and I learn. And I always ask my mother, I said, Mother, I come as everything white. I said, why is Jesus white with blonde and blue eyes? Why is the Lord's Supper all white men? Angels are white. Pope, and the Mary, and every, even the angels. I said, Mother, when we die, do we go to heaven? She said, naturally, we go to heaven. I said, well, what happened to all the black angels when they took the pictures? <laughs> I put this online, guys, and I said, what color is Jesus, what color is Santa Claus? And everyone's like going crazy. What color are you? What's wrong with you? I can't believe I'm discussing this either, but that is the most responses I think I've gotten in a year on social media is when I put that question up. And when I posted something last week about someone who looked like Jesus selling Christmas trees, the internet went crazy. It still remained unknown to some. And Ricky, Bobby, and Cal, well, they'll tell you how they see their Jesus. You're tiny Jesus. Your golden fleece diapers with your tiny little fat balled up fist pawing. He was a man. He had a beard. Look, I like the baby version the best. Do you hear me? I win the races and I get the money. I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says like, I want to be formal, right. but I'm here to party too. Because I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. Hmm. Maybe Jesus needs to change his look. You know, his image a little bit. Update it. You know, maybe shave off the beard. Maybe cut that hippie hair. You know, and can we make him a little more mixed? Maybe light skin? Can he wear like a turtleneck? Hmm. And can he sing? And maybe rap a little bit? And can he date Rihanna? Wait. That sounds like I'm describing Drake. Hmm. Drake would be a good Jesus in a film adaptation. Just saying. And of course, his dancing is questionable. And probably wouldn't need a stunt dancer for many of the scenes where Jesus dances. Alright, alright, well, enough about facial features. Where can I visit Jesus on Earth? Christians should have their own curses. Because I don't care how holy you are, you slam your hand in a car door, something's coming out of your mouth. Well, here we are in Louisiana. I love the South. Because it's a place where you can say whatever you want to about people. 
As long as you say bless his heart. <laughs> Sir, you can say awful things about people. It's the ugliest man I've ever seen in my life. Bless his heart. <laughs> Talk about how lazy they are. That's the laziest woman God ever created. Bless her heart. And what about his followers? The churches? Altogether, there are 37 million churches in the world, with 34,000 Christian. As of 2014, there is an estimated 4,200 different religions in the world. And these can be categorized into several main religions. These include Christianity, Roman Catholicism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Judaism. Then there are Muslims, supposedly for black people, but Muslims are just a little too black for me. You know, it's kind of like being black to the eighth power. Yeah. Kids got baptized in a black church. Wasn't prepared for that. And I just, I, I prefer white church myself. Black church just takes too long for me. You got to have your day free. You can't make no plans going to a black church. Yep. We shut up and we listen, you know? If somebody tries to talk while our preacher's talking, we tell them, shh, zip it focused, okay? One more song, we're gone. Gloves are off, God. God has taken my bird and my bush. God is a mean kid with a magnifying glass. Smite me, almighty smiter. Now, I'm not much for blaspheming, but that last one made me laugh. Are you spying on me? Who are you? I'm the one. Huh? Creator of the heavens and the earth. Alpha and Omega. Bruce, I'm God. Okay, how many fingers am I holding up? Now, Bruce, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. Hey, if you can't God. do it, man, that's cool. Three, two, four, nine, six, eight, one. How many now? Seven. In today's world, I guess you have to be on social media. I guess that means if Jesus had a Twitter, he'd have the most followers, right? Oh. Sorry, I forgot about Selena Gomez. She has 46.8 million followers. And Justin Bieber has 92.9 .9 million followers on Twitter. Sorry, Jesus. You're close, but you just don't quite have the following as today's pop stars. I point out uh, places of interest you should see while you're on vacation here. We have them in Burbank. Beverly Hills you must pay a visit to. It's kind of a silly city. Uh, and go on Rodeo Drive. Have you ever been to the church on Rodeo Drive? St. Francis of Agucci. <laughs> I want to tell you it is a ritzy church. I am not Catholic, but I went in with a friend of mine who was Catholic. Uh, <laughs> to hear his confession. And he got a recording. He said, this is Father O'Malley, I'm not in now. But if you leave your name and your sins, I'll get right back. <laughs> That's a ritzy... You know, before communion, they give you a wine list? <laughs> And I don't believe a word you've said here today. And furthermore, you're you know, so with so many different religions and denominations, and you'd think someone leave. would try to profit off of this, right? I assure you, this Senate panel will not exactly. rest until we put every last one of you shysters in jail. What you love? The ingots! Remain standing and uh, hold up your right hand, please. Do you uh, solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you God? So help me, my God. Televangelists are Christian ministers, whether official or self-proclaimed, who devote a large portion of their ministry to television broadcasting. You can almost call it a protective racket, and I'm talking about televangelists, that's right. The ones who rake in billions of dollars a year on donations because they are non-profit ministries. And could I just say what I think God would say to these people? Please. He would say, oh stubborn and rebellious child, 
Has my love no longer the power to melt your heart? Have you been driven away by those who claim to know me, but were filled with hypocrisy and greed and drunk with the stench of a death faith? Let the dead bury the dead. Let ignorance reproduce itself until it's weary of its own offspring. This is between you and me. Televangelism began as a uniquely American phenomenon resulting from a largely deregulated media where access to television networks and cable TV is open to virtually anyone who can afford it. Combined with a large Christian population that is able to provide the necessary funding. Holy Ghost anointed, I've been designated for the assignment. God, I will not fail you. So what was the history of the televangelists? Well, it started in the 1920s in radio. Christianity has always been emphasized preaching the gospel to the whole world taking uh, inspiration from the Great Commission. I think that Jesus is the product. Historically, this was achieved by sending missionaries, beginning with the depersion of the apostles, and later, after the invention of the printing press, included the distribution of Bibles and religious tracts. Some Christians realized that the rapid uptake of radio beginning in the 1920s provided a powerful new tool for this task and they were amongst the first producers of radio programming. And so the years passed to the 1950s. And after years of radio broadcasting in 1952, Rex Humbard became the first to have a weekly church service broadcast on television. By 1980, the Rex Humbard program spanned the globe across 695 stations in 91 languages, and to date, the largest coverage of any evangelicus program. Oral Roberts broadcast by 1957 reached 80% of the possible television audience through 135 of the possible 500 stations. The 1960s and early 70s saw television replace radio by the primary home entertainment medium, but also corresponds with a further rise in evangelical Christianity, particularly through the international television and radio ministry of Billy Graham. Many well-known televangelists began during this period, most notably Oral Roberts, Jimmy Swaggart, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, Jerry Falwell, and Pat Robertson. Most developed their own media networks, news exposure, and political influence. In the 21st century, some televised church services continue to attract large audiences. In the United States of America, there are Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, and T.D. Jakes. For years, when the tables were turned in 1988, he was forced to admit that he himself had um, availed himself of the services of a prostitute. So he confessed with many tears, as you saw. He stepped down from his ministry for three months. Then, despite having been defrocked by the Assemblies of God, he went back as an ordained minister of his own Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. Then, three years later, he was busted with another prostitute in his car, at which point he told his congregation that his proclivities were, and I quote, none of your business. So Jimmy Swaggart, the hooker, cry and repent about the hooker, hooker again guy. Not to be confused with Jim Baker, the secretary stripping fraud prison guy. Not to be confused with Ted Haggard. At the time of his scandal, Ted Haggard was the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. He was founder and senior pastor of New Life Church in Colorado Springs. Ted Haggard is the hooker, for what it's worth, dude hooker, uh, no crying, but also meth, which he bought but didn't use guy. Not to be confused with Jimmy Swaggart, the hooker, cry and repent about the hooker, hooker again guy. Not to be confused with Jimmy Jim Baker, the secretary stripping fraud prison guy, not to be confused with Marcus Lamb, co-founder of Daystar Television Network. Again, for the purposes of televangelist sexual confession taxonomy, the important thing here is this. Televangelists often dispute these criticisms, and they say they're doing God's work. They cite declining audience at traditional church services and their growth on global mass media as factors necessitating the use of television to fulfill the great commission of the gospel of Jesus to the generation of the 21st century. Can we agree, just for a moment, the televangelists are pretty scandalous? I mean, scandalous? I mean, they're full of scandal. <laughs> the question? Are Hinn and his colleagues using tax-free donations from believers to fund lavish lifestyles? Jesus Christ may have lived in poverty, but Benny Hinn lives large, in part off of tax-free donations his ministry collects from his followers. The blood of Jesus! The criticism is that you're leading a lavish lifestyle. Of course. Off. It's always been that, by the way. That, that criticism is nothing new. Well, let's talk about that. Okay, let's. As a follower of, of Jesus, um, yeah. you fly in a private plane. Yes, I You're do. You're staying right now in one of the fanciest hotels yes, in New York City. Yes, I am. You wear nice very clothes. nice clothing. So, 
Do you not have any misgivings about that? No. Look, you know, there's this idea, supposedly, that we preachers are, are supposed to uh, walk about with sandals and ride bicycles. That's nonsense. She came out of it. She's healed by the power of God. Millions of people all over the planet. His television show airs in 200 countries every day. Come on, lady. She can walk without the wheelchair, without the cane. The core of his appeal? His claim that God uses him to miraculously heal the sick. The people are so hungry for God here, my God. Whoa. If I was fake, I would absolutely give them back their money. But, but I believe that God called me to preach the gospel, which is very important. Hin was born to a Christian family living in Israel. As a young man, he became a devout evangelical. He now controls a ministry that collects an estimated $100 million a year in donations. It's being gone. Everything's gone. Everything's gone. Hin admits he doesn't have any medical verification of any of the healings, and in fact, some of the supposed healings have turned out to be not real at all. In Jesus' sweet name. Nine-year-old William Vandenkolk claimed his failing eyesight had improved at this Hin crusade in 2001. As soon as God healed me, I could see better. William is now 17 and still legally blind. I'd say I was caught up in the moment, being as young as I was, thinking I could actually be getting my vision back. Chuck Grassley's office tells us that Hin has cooperated fully with his investigation. After the interview, the in 2007, Senator Chuck Grassley opened a probe into the finances of six televangelists who preach a prosperity gospel. The probe investigated reports of lavish lifestyles by televangelists including fleets of Rolls Royces, mansions, private jets, and other expensive items purportedly paid by the television viewers who donate due to their ministry's encouragement of offerings. Ron, Ron, I'm really enjoying this and this, this is important. When I ask about the ongoing Senate investigation into Hinn's lavish lifestyle, funded in part by tax-free donations, from the faithful. Two years ago, the U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley launched an investigation into six major televangelists, including Benny Hinn. On the 6th of January, 2001, Grassley released his review of the six ministries' response to the inquiry. He called for further congressional review of tax exemption laws for religious groups. Can I please say something? The questions Dan asked me, I've been wanting someone to ask me for the last 20 years of my life. I think what this man did is fantastic and thank you for doing it. No, really, I'm very pleased. I, Why? I, because it's time for me to tell it all. I don't want people talking for me, I want to talk for myself. In case you're wondering, Hin says his annual salary is somewhere over half a million dollars a year, although he won't say how much over half a million dollars. We should also tell you that he insists that his private plane is not a luxury, that he travels too far and too often. One thing's for sure. We should all have a private relationship with Jesus. I mean, what happened to the simple times of it just being Jesus? All right, well... Back to the doubters, and yes, the believers. I mean believers. Because you get to go to heaven in a place that resembles the Wizard of Oz. I mean, I guess we're pretty much all the same, right? We all fall short of the glory of God. And at some point we all die and exit stage right, or is it left? I don't know, one or the other. It's either left or right, but we all have to exit out at one point. The things that make us the same. They're so small we hardly ever talk about them. Do you ever find yourself standing in one of the rooms in your house and you can't remember why you went in there? Death, the great equalizer. People across the globe and throughout time have believed that life endures beyond the grave. I saw a thing, actually, a study that said speaking in front of a crowd is considered the number one fear of the average person. I found that amazing. Number two was death. <laughs> death is number two? This means to the average person, if you have to be at a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. Even the show Family Feud makes us realize we all want similar things Family in the afterlife. Something you'd hate to find out you still got to do every day in heaven. Go to school? 
Go to school. Okay, three. <laughs> hmm, that seems a little too easy. What are my other options? Hmm. Just what is heaven? heaven or hell? And who I mean, I guess it's your safe? choice in the end. And maybe it should just be your choice. And you shouldn't tell anybody your choice. In bright light. Hmm, but hell. But, but what about the devil? Hmm. I mean, what is hell? Where did the devil come from? Lucifer and his warrior angels engaged the army of God led by the Archangel Michael. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. God sends the devil and his angels, and it's a place where Jesus said that those who reject him by faith will one day live. It's not to say that hell doesn't look bad to the bad after all. But the Wizard of Oz and the Pearly Gates with gold. Can we please go back to God now? I'm, I don't... This hell thing doesn't look that great. Let's just get back to God. Okay. Okay. Countless waves. Whew. Jesus definitely has an interesting following. I will say that. But maybe that's the best thing we can learn from Jesus. One of his core messages. You know, love one another. Help others in need. You know, because at the end of the day, we all are the same. And say what you will about Jesus, if you believe or don't. But it's his message of love and his ideal of what he died for that matters most for all of us. Come. But the question still remains, what if Jesus had never existed? What if Jesus got a percentage of everything with his name on it? And what if he was tax exempt? Hmm. Questions and more questions. I don't know. One thing's for sure though. We all need Jesus in our lives. Well, at least to get into heaven. But I think the most important part is to take care of yourself. And maybe God himself said it best. People want me to do everything for them. And what they don't realize is they have the power. You want to see a miracle, son? Be the miracle. Wait, are you leaving? Yeah, I figure you can handle things now. But what if I need you? What if I have questions? <laughs> That's your problem, Bruce. That's everybody's problem. Keep looking up. Prepare yourself. You know it's a must. Gotta have a friend in Jesus. So you know that when you die, it's gonna recommend you to the Spirit in the sky. Another theory from people who witnessed the abnormal activity is that it was a divine sighting. Jesus Christ walking across the water, carrying his staff. What's important is what light do we find shed on the origin of Christianity? There. Has just been removed, and archaeologists are now analyzing what's underneath it. The aim being can they see at the bottom where the rock goes back to and date it back to the time of when Jesus would potentially have been around.